Welcome to the first ever virtual medical school fair brought to you by the Association of American Medical Colleges. Today we're fortunate and pleased to have three medical school deans join us to answer your questions about applying to medical school. Dr. Theodore Hall has been an active participant at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA admissions program as an admissions subcommittee member, subcommittee chair for the subcommittee for disadvantaged applicants, and assistant dean for admissions. He is a professor of clinical radiology and currently the associate dean for admissions and chair of the admissions committee. He is the director for medical student education in radiology for the department of radiology. In this role, he is chair of the longitudinal didactic clerkship in radiology for the core clinical clerkship and the advanced radiology elective for fourth year medical students. He has also served as a faculty facilitator for the problem-based learning curriculum in the first year of the medical education program. Dr. Hall is a practicing diagnostic and interventional pediatric radiologist. Also joining us today is Dr. Michelle Whitehurst Cook, who has served as Dean for Admissions for 10 years at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, where she also graduated from medical school and completed a residency in family medicine. A graduate of the College of William and Mary with a degree in biology, she practiced family medicine in rural Virginia for 11 years prior to returning to VCU School of Medicine as one of the course developers and directors for their Foundations in Medicine course in 1993. As a member of the Family Medicine Department, she founded the International Inner City Rural Preceptorship Program in 2000. Her major interest is in understanding the needs and caring for underserved populations. And lastly, we have Dr. Robert Witzberg, Professor of Medicine as well as Associate Dean and Director of Admissions at Boston University School of Medicine. He is also a Professor of Health Policy and Management at Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Witzberg is board certified in internal medicine and has practiced general internal medicine on the Boston University Medical Campus since 1981. He served as the training program director and associate chief of medicine at Boston City Hospital for 12 years and was also a founder, president, and medical director of the Neighborhood Health Plan, a community health center-based HMO focused on enhancing the quality and scope of healthcare services available to vulnerable populations. His work has appeared in numerous medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, and in several medical textbooks and clinical manuals. Thank you all for your time. Today's questions come to us from Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, and other AAMC events. So let's get started with this first question from a AAMC webinar. Dr. Whitehurst Cook, do you look at an applicant's social media accounts when you're evaluating them? We do not look at it. Um, that doesn't mean that individual committee members when they're reviewing each file uh, doesn't look at it. If there's something in the application that seems to be applicable to us checking that out, then individual uh, members, but as a whole, we don't. Uh, with getting so many applications, it's just impossible to do that. However, uh, it doesn't mean that it won't get looked at. Dr. Witzberger Hall, would you like to comment about your school? I, I agree with what, what we just heard. Uh, we, uh, by policy, don't uh, investigate uh, social media accounts, but occasionally uh, we may uh, do so on the basis of other information in the file or something that's called to our attention. And occasionally an interviewer will respond to something that's heard at interview by checking out a social media site. And I would agree with um, what I also heard from our two colleagues here. Um, we do not have a policy at David Gaffin about uh, looking at uh, social media accounts, but uh, individual screeners and at the time of committee meetings, sometimes questions do arise that come up uh, and would be investigated that way, but it's generally not a policy that we will do. 
I, I think it's probably worth observing that for most admissions committees, we do expect that applicants uh, will be will accept the responsibilities of behaving in a reasonably professional manner. Uh, and if something is, is brought to our attention through a social media account which challenges that expectation, uh, that may not work for the applicant. Occasionally. Occasionally, mm -hmm. we'll get a picture of someone because uh, we do ask for the picture, and if that seems a bit inappropriate, that might be a reason to uh, go to someone's Facebook page to check them out. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go on to our next question, which comes to us uh, from Twitter. Uh, Dr. Hall, what are common characteristics and, ca and qualities that you find in ideal medical school applicants? We have a number that we probably would look for. I think in our screening process and also in our interview process, which is a multiple mini interview process, but we would probably uh, put our greatest emphasis on um, maturity, compassion, uh, some evidence of morality. Um, I think we'd like to see that they're involved with their community in most, in most cases. Uh, we're a school that also values research, and so we're, we're looking for curious, um, uh, academically inclined minds. Uh, and we are probably going to value um, things such as, uh, I would say, compassion, curiosity, uh, humanistic qualities that we are most often looking for in our applicants. One other thing that I forgot to mention is leadership. We're also looking for applicants who have leadership, uh, either activities that they've been involved in uh, and can display some evidence of that, uh, those, that particular skill set in their, their application. I will agree with what's been said. I, I, my advice to students is grades and MCATs will get you to the door, but it's all the other things, especially the community service and your clinical experiences that will help get you through the door and all the other experiences that you've had um, that's really important to us, that we look at you in a holistic point of view and not just in metrics. Yeah, I think uh it's important for applicants to give up on this notion that there's some ideal single best answer to a multiple choice exam that gets them into medical school. Uh, I certainly agree with what my colleagues have observed, but I think it's important to emphasize that there's no one way to get to this uh, ideal view of an applicant. Uh, people will We'll get there by different paths, we'll have different life experiences, we'll overcome different adversities, we'll take advantage of different opportunities, uh, and the applications all are evaluated individually. Uh, and uh, applicants just need to focus on the things that they care about, that they're passionate about, uh, that will help them grow as a person and as a future doctor, and then tell us about that and we'll share their excitement. Uh, if there, there's no magic formula for approaching this application and, and making yourself look ideal. I think that was well said. I would totally agree with that. I think too often applicants have a cookie cutter approach to this process and check off the boxes um, that they think are important for us. But in reality, it is a holistic review process, and every applicant has a different road traveled, and we value the roads that they're traveling, and we want to hear about it. One of the things that we find is that admissions deans and medical school admissions committees disagree about a lot of things, but one of the things I suspect we all agree about uh, uh, was mentioned very early on, and that is we care a lot about integrity and commitment honesty and empathy. These are kind of personal characteristics, traits that are hard to measure, but we are looking for them in the documents and in the interview. Uh, and, and this gets back to this uh, idea that we're, we're, we'll look at the whole person and, uh, and if we don't see evidence of those characteristics or worse, we see some behavioral evidence that people don't have those traits, that's a very hard uh, barrier to overcome. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Whitberg, we're going to go to you for the next question, which comes to us from the AAMC Minority Career Fair. 
How will you compare applicants who have old MCAT scores with those who have new MCAT scores? I think it's uh, it's important to recognize that different schools will approach this differently, uh, and uh, it, for us, and I think for many schools, uh, we're trying to look at the MCAT not in isolation, but in the broader context of a comprehensive or so-called holistic review of the entire application. Uh, and so we will look at the score, whether it's old or new, uh, in that broader context of everything else we can know about the person. So we begin by recognizing that a given MCAT score doesn't mean the same thing in two different applicants because it's in a different context and a different life experience. Uh, we are uh, trying to train ourselves in the era of uh, new and old MCATs together in a single applicant pool or even in a single application to look at the percentile rank uh, for a score and to understand and compare across uh, applicants by thinking about their percentile rank rather than the raw score. We like the fact that the new exam covers a broader range of academic competencies. And we like the fact that it gives us more information uh, about how applicants are likely to perform in medical school and as physicians. At BCU, we also use the percentiles, and we recognize as a committee um, sort of what our bottom lines are going to be. But if someone has done well on an old MCAT that's within three years of the time of starting medical school, then we don't require that people take the new MCAT. Um, we realize they're costly, and if they've proven themselves once, they don't have to prove themselves again, if, as long as it's within the time frame that we recommend. And since the MCAT is only one part of what we look at, then it's really important that they spend that extra time maybe improving some other areas of their application. I would agree with what's been said. Um, we also use percentiles when we are comparing old and new MCATs. I think the reality, though, is that because the new MCAT is a new examination, um, schools do not really know what the scores will predict in terms of the academic performance until we have some more data down the road to determine how well those exams predict performance in our individual schools. But for the time being, percentage, uh, percentile ranks are the way we will compare new and old. That's exactly right. I, if I might add to this, uh, when we see an applicant uh, who has both exams uh, in the file, uh, we will ask, so why are they different? What changed? Or is it that the new exam is assessing academic proficiencies that were not measured on the old exam. So we we don't ignore either. We look at both of them when we have both and try to understand what the combination of scores can teach us about that applicant's preparation. Our next question is for Dr. Whitehurst Cook. It comes to us from Twitter. What active measures, if any, are you taking at your school in particular to reduce medical school costs? Well, our dean has been invested in this for several years now. Um, he assures first-year students when they start medical school that there will be no more than a 4% increase in tuition over the four years that they're going to be here. Um, we also have had several campaigns and, and recently started an 1838 campaign, which is the year our school was founded. Um, to try to raise money um, through all sources, a uh, huge fundraiser, um, but all the money is going towards student debt and uh, scholarship programs. Um, so it, it's, it's an idea that medical school does cost a lot, um, that we need to uh, add through scholarships help for students, but we also have a, a very strong financial aid department that works with students from before they get here. We meet with them when they actually come for interview and start talking about the importance of them uh, budgeting their money, um, looking at how they spend costs, sharing rooms, different uh, advice that we can give to them um, so that their costs don't have to be as high. Um, we realize the students 
sometimes can borrow way more money than they need. And so really having them to look at a budget and share that with us so that we're making sure that they are only borrowing what they need and real, they know that they can get other money if they if the need arises. But for the time being, just keep costs down by only borrowing what actually you have projected to need. Um, so all of those things are going on here and um, to help us be successful keeping student debt down. I think Dr. Uh, Whitehurst Cook has mentioned the, the major factors. I, I suspect most medical schools are working on some variation of those themes. I would just emphasize here at BU two specific points. One is that uh, in addition to trying to hold down the cost of tuition, we're, we're devoting a lot of energy to educating our students about how to manage the financial burden of attending medical school so as to minimize the downstream impact on, uh, on their life choices and opportunities that they face. Uh, and also we, um, a number of years ago, built an on-campus medical student residence uh, for which we raised uh, considerable endowment funds, and we used the endowment income from that building fund to subsidize the, the cost of living in the building. So we guarantee access for every entering student in our class, uh, and about two-thirds of our entering students choose to live in the building and uh, their their actual out-of-pocket cost to live there is below not just Boston market rate rents, but below the operating cost of the building because we're substitute we're, we're subsidizing with uh, this housing scholarship. We are doing at the David Gavin School of Medicine similar uh, things as my colleagues has mentioned um, as far as uh, reducing the cost is concerned. What we try to do mostly as a state school is try to maintain or to um, um, decrease the amount of tuition increases that we get or mandate, uh, mandated to make from the state. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the last five to six years to have um, um, a benefactor, Dr. Uh, David Geffen, uh, who has been able to pro uh, provide considerable resources for us. In fact, the Geffen Scholarship that we offer to roughly about I would say uh, two-thirds of our applicants probably get this offer. Not all of them accept it, but it's a full tuition scholarship. It, it covers also full their expenses as far as their room and their board and other expenses. So it is really a full ride. And then we have a second scholarship that we offer called the Leaders of Tomorrow Scholarship, which is really a full tuition and fee scholarship. Uh, so those. Between those two offers that we make to our entering class, uh, roughly about, uh, I would say, 40% of our class has uh, at least a full tuition and fee scholarship and, and, a, and a good number of them, 37 out of the 175 in the last two years, have had a full ride scholarship where all four years are paid for. Uh, those are our two biggest scholarships. We also have other scholarships that we're offering. I would say that the one group that probably needs financial aid uh, the most and, and we're working on ways of figuring out how to help them is our disadvantaged candidates. Many of these applicants who come to our school, and I'm sure this is true in other places, come in with significant debt uh, because they've had to finance their undergraduate education to a large degree in some cases on credit cards, and so their consumer debt, which our, our financial aid office is not able to take into account when awarding financial aid, oftentimes leaves them in a place where they are uh, somewhat um, uh, struggling a little bit with uh, finances in this environment. And so what we have tried to do in the last couple of years is work with our development office in identifying uh, donors who would be willing to support these students uh, on, a, on a more regular basis outside of the financial aid that they uh, currently get to help them bridge that gap um, that many of them come in with because of the amount of debt that they uh, accrue during their undergraduate years. Um, but that's a special group of students and um, for the most part, the vast majority of our students uh, get uh, adequate financial aid um, and, uh, and in fact, most of them, uh, a good number of them, are getting um, a, a total free ride to, uh, for their four years. 
Thank you, Dr. Hall. If you could help us with our next question, which comes to us from a AAMC webinar, what is your timeline after the interview process for sending acceptance letters out? We have a, um, a rolling admissions process, and so if I, if I look at our timeline, um, it really begins in, in early June when AMCAS opens up their, their application and uh, students are able to file their application. We start our screening process in mid-July, uh, which is about the time when we'll get close to 2,500 to 3,000 applications coming into our office. Um, the process of interviewing begins in um, early September now and goes all the way through uh, the end of February and sometimes into the first week of March. Uh, committee meetings will begin in October for us, and so the earliest that any of our candidates could possibly hear from us uh, for um, acceptance is because our committees would like to actually get through a number of interviewed applicants before they make any offers. Uh, would probably be early uh, uh, to mid-December, right before the Christmas holidays. In fact, this year, our first acceptances went out for the first time in a while uh, before the Christmas holidays began. Our website actually says January 15th is when we're going to send out the bulk of our acceptances, and, and we put that date in there because we like to keep that as a sort of uh, fail-safe date, um, and if we can, we like to uh, let applicants know sooner. So I would say uh, from the time that they interview, depending on the time of year, if they're coming in early September, it could be up to six to eight weeks before they could actually uh, hear back from us, and maybe even a little bit longer. But as the interview season goes on, they could potentially hear back very much sooner, sometimes within two to four weeks. Uh, after they've interviewed for us. I think one uh, of the burdens applicants carry is the fact that every medical school has its own unique view of how this should work. Uh, it would be obviously much simpler from the applicant perspective if we all followed the same protocol, but we don't, uh, and our policies and procedures typically match the uh, other factors about our schools and make sense within our institution, but may not make sense across the board of all institutions. So here at BU, we interview in two rounds. Uh, round one begins in early September and ends in early December. At the end of round one, we, uh, by design, have done about two-thirds of our our interviewing, our admissions committee has a series of meetings through through the rest of the month of December, and in early January we issue decision letters to uh, the people who interviewed in round one. Uh, so we have a tightly restricted number of acceptance letters we send in early January. We've typically done about two thirds of our interview, and we allow ourselves enough acceptances to fill only about one third of the seats in the class. We decline some applicants from round one for whom it's clear that this isn't going to work. Uh, and we defer a final decision on a group of round one applicants. By the time those letters are going out in early January, we uh, have all already resumed interviewing for a smaller round two group. Uh, we complete those interviews in early February, and by early March, uh, the Committee on admission sends its final set of letters. For its round two deliberations, we have the smaller round two interview group. We pull forward the deferred group from round one and interleave them together, uh, producing a group that's about the same size as round one was, but this time we have twice as many seats available because of the holdback on acceptances in round one. This is process is designed to ensure that we don't fall into the trap of accepting people uh, to fill the class before we finished interviewing. So it, uh, this process allows us to uh, assure every applicant that it doesn't matter at all when in our season they interview. If they interview with our school, they have an equal shot compared to any other interview day in the season. Uh, BCU starts interviewing uh, in late August, and we interview actually through March. We have several offer dates. So we offer October 16th. We uh, make another set of offers December 16th and the last set February 1st, and then we fill the class March 16th. Each of those dates, we make about a 25% offer. 
uh, of the class. And then uh, after that, in March, when we fill the class, we start working from the wait list. Uh, we take about 50-50 in-state, out-of-state, and our wait list reflects that. We have an in-state wait list and an out-of-state wait list. Um, so technically, we are filling um, the class you are interviewing when we still have seats uh, open in the class by doing only a quarter of the class at each um, time we make offers. Thank you. I, I guess I should have observed, uh, by virtue of our name, Boston University, some people are confused. We are a private nonprofit, not a public school. Uh, we uh, do not care where our applicants are from. The uh, state of residence plays no role at all in our, in our decision-making process. Dr. Witzberg, if you could help us with our next question, which comes to us from Reddit. Um, what advice would you give to yourself today if you were applying? I, I think that I, I'm going to try to answer this question uh, briefly. I could probably, each of us could probably talk for hours about this. My first advice to people would be chill out. <laughs> uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint, uh, and what we're really interested in is how applicants have chosen to live their lives. What commitments have they made uh, to their academics and to other experiences, to other activities, uh, how they have chosen to allocate their energy and their time, uh, in what ways they have given of themselves and challenged themselves, not just intellectually, but have they challenged the hypothesis that medicine is the career for them? Uh, how have they learned from their various experiences, both successes and failures? Uh, so uh, our most important advice that really falls under the, the rubric of chill out is stop thinking about us and think about you. Think about what it is that you hope for in your life. How is it that you choose to live a life of service? Uh, and make your commitments. Do things you're passionate about. Get kicked around a little bit by all of that. Grow with it and tell us about it and that will be a successful application uh, and much more likely to be an attractive, powerfully compelling application than one in which uh, somebody tries to figure out, well, what is the admissions committee looking for and how can I meet that expectation? Don't worry about that. You, gotta, you have to meet all the requirements, but spend your time doing what you believe is important in your life and we will be interested in that with you. I tell the students to enjoy the journey. I think the journey of exploration to make sure that this career in medicine is for you and we have to see by your experiences and how you talk about them in your essay, how other people talk about them in the letters of reference, whether you have really done due diligence to that. But we also are looking for, and I use two words, we're looking for smart and nice people. So smart, obviously, the metrics, but then the other part is uh, what have you done uh, that's different from your classmates? Because we're looking not for, the, someone mentioned the cookie cutter, we're not doing that. We're looking for people who are going to bring different um, things to the table. They're going to have different characteristics, going to have different experiences, different levels of expertise in different topics or different areas. And so when we, at the end of the day, we want to have a class of people that can teach each other. And so if you have things that you are interested in and that you want to become an expert in or learn a little bit more about, or you want to have some experience that gives you more resources that you can share with your patients when you become not only a doctor, but a student doctor, that those things are, are really important. And if you do the things that you enjoy, that you're most interested in, at the end of the day, you will be the kind of student that we're looking for. And you don't know what your classmates are going to look like. So you can't predict, well, I bet somebody's going to do this and I want to do that. You just go for what it is that you're passionate about. If you're going to do community service, pick something you're passionate about. Uh, if you're going to do research, really look at the things that you're interested in. Um, whatever you do, um, make sure it's going to help you grow, uh, as Dr. Wurtzberg said, as a patient, as you know, that make you grow as a person. 
I kind of like what my, my colleagues, Michelle and Bob, have actually both said about um, this process. I do think they, uh, students need, need to chill, and they do need to uh, think about what it is they are passionate about that they want to um, put forward. I like to think about it as the road traveled. Um, a former colleague of ours, Gabe, um, uh, uh, would always say it's about their road traveled. And I think, I think that, that that has a lot to say about what it is that has driven them to become physicians. And so knowing what their, your road traveled is may be different from somebody else's road traveled is fine. Um, I do think, however, that um, when you do participate in certain kinds of activities that are going to help develop your uh, personal attributes uh, and expand you as an individual, uh, and prepare you for this uh, career choice, that you try to get the most out of those activities. I think uh, longitudinal long-term commitments sometimes are some, uh, some of the best contributors to developing a person, rather than a lot of short-term um, uh, one-off type of activities. And too often, I think, medical uh, school applicants come to the table thinking, the more I put down on my application, the better. And what I would really like to see us get to um, as an applicant group is that we start to value as applicants the individual long-term commitments that really do help an individual grow in the um, um, idea that they want to become a doctor, a physician for, uh, for a community of patients. Um, and those longitudinal long-term activities can be in various different areas as, as long as they provide an opportunity for you to explore um, the things that you think are going to be important for your future in medicine and also then allow you to grow as a person, as an individual. So sometimes it's really about quality, not so much quantity. And that would be my advice. Um, I think that too often it's about the quantity rather than the quality. Okay, our next question is for Dr. Whitehurst-Cook, also from Reddit. How much do you hold a weak undergraduate performance against a student who did strongly in a graduate program? Well, we look at that all the time because we have our own certificate program and we look at students coming from all over the country and other post back programs. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with how well they do in the graduate program how much coursework they took in the graduate program. It's really hard to, um, you know, take 80 to 90 credits of really poor performance in the undergraduate work uh, versus 20 credits in a graduate program and say, well, now that they've shown themselves. But if they've been in a good solid program and we, you know, know the programs that have um, produced great doctors and their MCATs, this, again, we look at the MCAT scores, if their MCATs are solid, and they have to have done everything. They can't just have done graduate work. They have to have their clinical experience, a community service, hopefully some research, some leadership, and other things that go into making great doctors. Um, we definitely do give them a look if they have done well. We, in our certificate program, if they have a 3.5 or higher, and uh, under the old system, a 28 MCAT, now a 504, um, then they will get uh, an interview. We guarantee an interview. You know, I, I think there's something backwards about the way this question was asked because it focuses attention uh, on the, I think, misapprehension that admissions committees are looking for some fatal flaw that they can focus on and, and eliminate an applicant. I think admissions committees are much more often looking for major strengths rather than significant defects. Uh, you know, if, some, if somebody failed three quarters of their courses as an undergraduate, that application isn't going to fly. But uh, setting aside that kind of extreme case, admissions committees are much more focused on attributes and strengths and contributions than they are on weaknesses. Uh, and and uh, as my colleagues have uh, have said, uh, if
if an application is evaluated holistically and comprehensively, uh, then uh, blemishes or challenges or struggles in parts of the academic record are not necessarily um, uh, a fatal flaw. They rather can be looked at in the context of what else we know about that person and his or her subsequent performance. Yeah, I would agree, um, Bob. I think that that is um, totally correct. I think that some some applicants again have a, a different background that they bring to their undergraduate experience, and as a result, they may have a uh, slower start um, than other applicants. And we do recognize that upward trends are probably better, most likely better than downward uh, trends in terms of that. Um, Many of our applicants will have uh, gone through a post -bac program or a, um, done a, a master's program in a, in a science area to try and improve their academic uh, uh, competitiveness for medical school. And so we will take that into account uh, when, we're, when we're looking at uh, those applicants and we will uh, value that, that kind of insight about their own performance and what they need to uh, make themselves more competitive. Um, but it is it is actually um, best uh, said, as, as Bob said, it's best looked at in the context of the individual, I think. Uh, sometimes uh, different applicants have different reasons for poor performances, and we would want to know what those are and uh, evaluate them in the context of the total applicant when we're, thinking, when we're making this. And I think that it's also sh true for even people who haven't done post -bac programs, but people who don't do well first year of college because they came from a, a high school that poorly prepared them or that they came you know, from a rural area or inner city high school. And I think it's important to know that when you get to those, uh, high, those uh, colleges and universities, it might be a really difficult transition. But for those people who've been able to hang in there and find the resources they need and still do well coming out their junior and senior year, um, sometimes those people who've hit a, a rock and have been able to learn to jump over it um, are much better in medical school because medical school is hard and some people have never gotten a B. They've all gotten straight A's and for them sometimes the adjustment to not being at the top is very tough whereas some of these students who've really worked harder um, to get to the top uh, come with more resilience. I think a lot of this emphasizes the critical importance of an admissions committee having an understanding of the applicant's life story. Uh, we need that information because that is the, the foundation that allows us to make the kinds of judgments uh, that, uh, that Ted and Michelle are talking about. We can't understand the distance traveled unless we have the basic facts and I think applicants are well advised to ensure that we have that information. Uh, not because they're looking to make excuses, but rather because they're hoping to paint a clear picture of who they are and what they're about and how they got to our door. Okay, our next question is for Dr. Hall, also from Reddit. Do you feel students today are more or less prepared for medical school than in previous years? Uh, my, in my opinion, um, you know, we have over 12,000 applicants this year, 12,800 applicants this year. And I would say that I see quite a variety or range in preparation. So I'm going to have to answer that question and say I think that they are um, more prepared. In fact, if I look at um, data from our previous classes, our applicant pool um, uh, tends to, uh, our accepted, sorry, our matriculated students, tend to be an average age of about 25 or so, which means that most of our students are probably taking an extra year or two before they, uh, post undergraduate, before they actually apply to medical school. Um, and, and probably the ones that we are accepting are the ones that who, who have some other experiences outside of their undergraduate uh, education. So with that in mind, I think that they are trying to become a little bit more prepared for this this career that they want to embark on. Um, and, and by becoming more prepared, I think we, we see uh, um, maybe a, a, an older group of applicants that we are uh, potentially accepting when we talk about the average age of our, our matriculating class at the David Geffen School of Medicine. 
So I, I would have to say yes. I think that they are um, more or less um, probably more prepared than they were in the past. At VCU, the average age is about the same. We're about 24 and a half. So definitely in that, that percentage is moving uh, more. Uh, used to be 40, 60, no, 50, 50. Now we're about 60% of the non-traditional um, students. And I think they are, they know what they want. They are willing to study and, and they're a little bit more chilled. Um, but at the same time, uh, we look at our grades and the board scores and you know, every year they, they're better. So if you use that, then I think the students get better every year. Um, and they certainly seem to be, um, in terms of the academics, very strong. Now, I, I was tempted to answer this question, are, uh, are students more or less prepared by saying yes? <laughs> I, I think that we need to be a little bit cautious about making generalizations. I think certainly what Ted and Michelle have said is, is all correct. Uh, we're seeing more diverse student bodies uh, by, by age, by gender, by life experience, by, by race and ethnicity, and all that I think contributes to individual and group preparation being stronger, um, 60 to 65 percent of our students are out of college for one or more years, uh, so certainly that life experience has them better prepared. On the other hand, we see a broader range of academic preparation. We have more people who majored outside of the natural sciences who may have a more uh, superficial preparation in some of the traditional areas of uh, foundational uh, coursework for medical school applicants. Uh, so I think our, our medical schools are by and large uh, coming around to seeing that we need to uh, uh, help each individual student uh, understand his or her level and depth and breadth of preparation at a much more granular, fine-tuned level than in the past, and make and it ought to be our obligation to uh, assure that any student who we commit to, we in fact commit to, and it's our job uh, to give that to help that student uh, in any possible way to be successful. Dr. Whisper, the next question is for you. What's the proper way to update a school if something's changed for an applicant, such as more experience in an area or additional coursework has been completed? This is another example of the challenges applicants face by virtue of the fact that schools are all unique in the way they would, the kinds of information they would like and the way they would like to receive it. Uh, and so applicants really need to uh, make sure they understand individual school expectations and then meet those expectations for each school uh, to which they have applied. Uh, and it can be extremely variable. Some schools will uh, prefer not to get a lot of information after the application is completed. Others are quite open and receptive to having additional information. Uh, here at BU, we consider ourselves an information-hungry uh, group where we are happy to receive information. We uh, invite applicants to upload documents to uh, uh, our application portal at any time in the, uh, that they still have an active file with us. Uh, we're happy to receive additional letters of recommendation uh, if uh, all of this is organized around the expectation uh, that the material we're being sent is a substantive addition to what we already know. We're not looking for fluff, but we're looking for substance. Uh, in particular, if applicants are still in school when they apply we would, uh, and their application is still open in January, we'd like to see fall semester grades. Uh, if people are in a research position or in a job or some other activity that they were not in or had just started when they submitted their initial application back in June or July, we'd like to see an update, a le an update letter from a research mentor or a supervisor or some other uh, information related to current activities. If applicants uh, believe they've learned something about themselves and about our school that is worth uh, telling us, we'd be happy to have them tell us. And all of this stuff can be uploaded directly to uh, our applicant portal. If people have trouble with that, they can ask our staff to help them. 
I would again just emphasize that this is a very school specific question and applicants just need to be certain that they understand what individual schools are looking for and how they would like to receive it. At VCU, we really like e emails to update us on significant uh, information that's new. So as Bob said, uh, new grades at the end of semesters. Um, we don't take MCATs after September 30th of the year that they apply, um, so that usually is not an issue. Um, if they published a paper or a, pub a paper has been uh, accepted for publication, we like to see the citation. And if they do have a new job or, or research experience or some other experience, I tell them not to email me to say, oh, I got a new job yesterday, but it should be some significant amount of time, at least three months, so they can relay what they've been learning and what they've gotten out of that experience. And right now, they just email that directly to me. At David Gaffin, we will accept any and all updates. Uh, I would think that the best way for us to receive, and as Bob said, this is school specific, would be by either um, UPS mail or um, email. Uh, a, a cover letter would be great with the description of what they want to update us with, and then if it's a citation or a uh, or, or a uh, new activity that they've been involved in, that they can send that in the um, in the email for us or in the uh, in the uh, regular mail for us that way. With regard to transcripts and grades, uh, we typically will ask for a completed transcript at the end of the process, so that it's not something we usually uh, will uh, request anywhere during the interview process. But if an applicant has some uh, uh, scholastic work that they'd like us to know about, uh, we can certainly add that to their file uh, for the uh, committee to consider in its deliberations. Dr. Whitehurst Cook, if you could help us with the next question, also from Reddit. Will it look bad if I took a quarter off from school, work, volunteering to study for the MCAT? Can I take time off to study for the test? We don't usually see that, but again, it would depend on the student's circumstances uh, and history. So they would need to really have a good explanation of why they had to do it because the exam is given so many times a year now, many students who feel like they need the extra time to just focus on the exam will take it in August uh, where they can spend the summer, uh, June, July, studying for the MCAT. That way they can take it rather than taking a semester off. Uh, many students say, well, I really want to apply earlier, so I want my MCATs earlier. And I said, well, if you take the MCATs before you're ready and haven't really had time to study the way you need to, been able to focus, take a review course, or however you plan to study, um, and you get a poor score, then that is not going to help you. So you really need to wait and take the MCATs when you're ready to take them, meaning that you've studied enough, that you've done lots of practice tests, and those practice test scores are reflective somewhat of what you would get on a real exam. And so to use those scores to help you know when you are definitely ready to take it. So again, it's unusual for people to take a semester off and then come back to school uh, just to study for MCATs, but I would tend to use the summer uh, for that. If they're finishing college in December and going to take the fall, the spring semester to study, that's probably fine, um, but it's unusual to see them take a semester off. I, I guess I think the underlying issue here is the uh, the common misconception that there's some ideal sequence and timing and moment to uh, take the MCAT and to apply to medical school. Uh, if somebody's thinking about taking a semester off to study for the MCAT, I, I, I would submit that the real question is why is the timing of your application to medical school so tightly constrained in your mind that you feel the need to interrupt uh, your other important work in order to prepare for the MCAT? Uh, almost all 
always there's going to be a better way to do that. I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Whitehurst Cook. I, I, I can't remember very many applicants who've taken a semester off to prepare for the MCAT, but rather people, I think, quite sensibly juggle their priorities and think about whether maybe applying after they've been out of college for a year would be a better option, uh, focus on their academic work and their activities, and then focus on preparing for the MCAT rather than interrupting their education. Yeah, I would agree with that sentiment also, Bob, um, that you just expressed, that it's, it's probably more ma uh, a management issue, a planning issue in terms of uh, when the student is actually prepared to take the exam. Uh, and Michelle made this point also, I think. Uh, when, when, when students are thinking about how they want to apply to medical school, oftentimes they feel this pressure sometimes to apply when everybody else is applying. Um, and they may not be in the same time frame or same timetable as everybody else. And so I think individual students really need to recognize, okay, when I put my backwards clock together and I look down the road, when is I to be prepared for this, um, this particular exam to take it, what I need to do in order to get there. And sometimes it's not always in the same time frame that everybody else is, is operating within. And then the student has to, uh, at some point, be a little bit more organized about how they approach this, um, this, this particular uh, preparation for the examination. Uh, it could be argued that their preparation for the exam begins day one when they declare their pre-med and they start taking all the courses that are necessary to do well in that examination, rather than thinking about it uh, in such a short period of time, right before I take the exam, I'm going to take off a few months beforehand for it. And that's sort of the exact opposite that a lot of students reflect to me who say, I think if I take it in the summer, the schools are going to think that I'm not as competitive as if I take it during the semester when it's competing against my other coursework, that they think that it's um, better for me to take it during the semester. And I think for, for VCU anyway, it really, you just need to be ready to take it. You need to have been able to make the decision. I mean, some people take it without even taking physics, and then they don't do well, and they have to retake it. So you really have to know yourself. You have to test it yourself and make sure you're ready. And if you take it before you're ready, then that's part of us evaluating your maturity. You know, why did you make that decision? So every decision you make comes under um, the microscope to really look at how and why you made the decisions you did. Um, but for us, if you take it during the summer, if you take it during the school year, as long as you do well, um, it's really not an issue of when you took it. Okay, we have one last question. This is for Dr. Hall, also from Reddit. Are prospective students allowed to spend a day on campus to see if the culture of the school is right for them? Yes, um, I would say, and, and the way we work that out is we have we have two mechanisms for actually uh, students to visit us. The first one is um, uh, our second look day, which is usually in the springtime. So once a, an applicant has been accepted to our medical school, they will be told about the second look, and at that point we have a uh, two-day, uh, two-and-a-half-day program that we put together for them. Uh, in which they can actually come and visit us, talk with our medical school, meet our faculty, and get an overview of what the school would be like uh, and even meet some of their future classmates. Uh, for students who don't get to participate in Second Look, they can always call us at some point after they've been accepted or even before sometimes uh, because they may want to make some decisions beforehand to talk to us about arranging possible uh, visits and tours. And oftentimes under those circumstances during the school year, when we have those one-off types of visits where an individual wants to come to the environment, we'll hook them up with one of our first and second year medical students and they can go uh, spend part of their day with those students uh, doing a tour of the school as well as the campus environment um, where the medical center is, uh, and also participate or at least observe uh, classes. Um, they're either going to be in a lecture or a small group, uh, problem-based learning group, or in a lab with that student on the, any one particular day, depending on when they come. Uh, and so they'll get an idea of what the culture of the school is like as far as its academic profile is concerned, and actually be able to meet some of the students and talk to them. So those are the two opportunities that we uh, mostly provide for students. 
uh, to actually, uh, or applicants, prospective applicants, to actually get an opportunity to come and see what our, see what our program is like. Again, I think this is an individual school-specific approach. Uh, I think many schools uh, now have some form of open house or se second look weekend, which allows people to get a closer uh, sense of the community. Uh, many of our applicants uh, stay overnight uh, pr the evening prior to their interview uh, with student hosts. Uh, they'll often get a chance to meet a number of students, uh, may come early enough to sit in on a class uh, if they wish to do that. Uh, and, and some uh, accepted applicants will ask if uh, we can help them come visit uh, on an individual basis af uh, after their acceptance. And we pretty much always are able to find a first or second year student who's willing to have them come and spend a day um, going to class or going to a seminar with them and getting a sense of the community, have lunch with folks, uh, uh, spend some time uh, in, with students in the evening. We do think it's important that applicants focus a lot of attention uh, before, during, and after their interview day on getting a sense of the culture of the of the institution and the community they would think about joining. Uh, they're going to get a good medical education most uh, most everywhere they might go, uh, but uh, they may find a better fit, a more comfortable fit, a more appropriate. Uh, uh, community in uh, in different places, and they need to work on getting that sense from students and from other resources. Yes, we do have a host program as well when they come to interview, and then uh, during the interview day, we make sure that they meet with M4 and M2 students, and oftentimes meet with students at other levels as well. Um, we don't have a second look. Um, we are looking into that, but students are contacted by other students once they are home and they have email addresses that they can email students to ask them questions that maybe didn't get answered while they were here or that came up after they left. So uh, it is important to us that they feel comfortable in calling back. We do have a program where they, if they want to during the summer after we finish interviewing, uh, that they can come and visit the campus one-on-one uh, -on -one if they would like. Well, thank you all very much for this informative and really wonderful hour of your time. Um, we want to encourage everyone to go take a, a look at your medical schools and all of the other participating medical schools in their booths. And we look forward to speaking to you at the AAMC booth as well. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share with us, why not reach out to us at aspiringdocs at AAMC.org. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you at the booth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.